Hi, welcome back. In the last video, we looked at the first part of glycolysis, which was the preparatory phase, and we got all the way down to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and we said that ultimately one glucose was enough to yield two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And actually, let me rewind that, which was G3P, two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those, and, and actually this is this pathway that we're doing now is happening for both glyceraldehyde three phosphates, but I'm just going to count one um, in in uh, the pathways that I'm going to show you. But just know that this is happening for both glyceraldehyde three phosphates. So let me go ahead and draw. Oops, let me scroll back over. Let me go ahead and draw this. So. When we left off last time, this is what we had, right? We had glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and immediately this, this molecule is going to be consumed by an enzyme called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And usually, um, for, this, for space's sake, I'm going to abbreviate dehydrogenase as DH. Um, and actually, usually, that's actually how they are abbreviated to begin with. And what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to, first of all, you're going to start with an NAD plus, and you're going to get out an NADH. So this is our first production of NADH, and, and, and this NADH is going to go into the electron transport chain. And later on, we'll talk about the function of the electron transport chain, but suffice it to say for now, the NADH is going to go over there. It's going to you know, power the you know, proton pumping and ATP synthase and all that stuff. And also what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to take inorganic phosphate and put it into the molecule, right? So we're going to end up with, oops, we're going to end up with something like this. We are going to end up with something like this. And this molecule has a, has a name. It's called 1,3-Biz. one three bisphosphoglycerate okay and this molecule is then going to be consumed by another enzyme and this enzyme is called I'm going to abbreviate it PG phosphoglycerate kinase and this molecule or this enzyme right here is going to be one of our productions of ATP so what I'm going to do oops what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and draw adenosine diphosphate, but I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to go ahead and draw it with the phosphate right there. So there's my ADP. And this is going to be a simple substrate level phosphorylation. So phosphoglycerate kinase is going to basically, here's going to be the electrons. It's going to hit this phosphate and kick this up onto the carboxyl group. And so what this generates is something called, and I'll draw it over here, it's going to generate 3-phosphoglycerate. I'll go ahead and write that right here. It's going to generate 3, oops, let me go back, 3-phosphoglycerate. Three phospho, and so notice we're naming it 8 because it's a carboxylate right here. And this is going to be our first generation of ATP in the payoff phase. So notice, I'll come back here, right? We'll come back and notice that one glucose yields two G3P. So there's two of all of these happening. So basically right now, right now, if I can get back, I'm um, still getting used to this right now. We, are, we have generated, ultimately, two ATP right here. So we've basically made up for the two ATP that we burned in the preparatory phase, right? Okay, so now, now we're going to have another enzyme. Crap. Sorry. Right. We're going to have another enzyme. And this enzyme is called phosphoglycerate mutase. 
And before we go any further, I just want to basically define what a mutase is. Mutases are essentially constitutional isomerases. So they're going to generate a constitutional isomer of whatever the substrate is. Okay. Recall that constitutional isomers, all they are really is they're just um, they're mole two molecules that have the same molecular formula but different structural formulas. So essentially what the net effect of this enzyme is going to be is it's, it's going to take the phosphate from the 3 position on 3-phosphoglycerate and it's going to move it to the 2 position. Now what I want to be clear about is this is not um, that the same phosphate. So really we're going to generate an intermediate here. Okay. So the first thing that's going to happen is a phosphate is going to come in and it's going to kick off a water. Okay. And so what we're going to generate is this. We're going to generate this intermediate. And this intermediate is called 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or sometimes abbreviated 2,3-BPG. This is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And actually, this molecule is actually of prime importance in oxygen transport. Turns out that this molecule actually has some control on hemoglobin as to whether the oxygen is bound or not bound, but that, that's the subject of a different video. And this 2,3-BPG is then going to be um, reacted with the rest of the enzyme, and that water is going to come back in here and hydrolyze off the phosphate that is on the 3 position. So if we were to number these phosphates, we call this one 1 and this one 2, right? So here's the one, here's the two right there, try to fit it in there. And so the one that gets hydrolyzed off is the one. So what we end up with, let me scroll down, is we end up with something called 2-phosphoglycerate. Two 2-phosphoglycerate. Two and um, I also should mention one thing, and I, I forgot to do it, is that this particular reaction and um, this particular reaction is an equilibrium reaction. So it can go in either direction depending on whether or not you are going in gluconeogenesis or you're going through um, uh, gluconeogenesis, you're going through glycolysis. And, and actually this one is an equilibrium reaction as well, and so is that one. So the only irreversible reactions we have in glycolysis are hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, and as we'll see later, pyruvate kinase. Everything else is going to be in equilibrium. Uh, of course, one side is favored over the other. And actually, this is a good time to review Le Chatelier's principle. So if you're undergoing glycolysis, right, and you're trying to decide whether or not you're going to, you know, the, which direction of phosphoglycerate mutase is going to be favored, well, if I'm undergoing glycolysis, I've probably loaded up a lot of 3-phosphoglycerate, right? And so by Le Chatelier's principle, to relieve the stress on the equilibrium, it's going to shift towards 2-phosphoglycerate. So let me go ahead and write that right here. This is, oops, this is 2-phosphoglycerate, 2-phosphoglycerate, okay? Now this next reaction is a very important reaction, and it's called enolase and in this reaction we're going to have an expulsion of water and one thing I want to mention about this particular reaction before I go into what forms it this reaction has what's called a positive delta S and delta S is just the change in entropy and what this does for the reaction is makes it very favored in this direction now this is an equilibrium reaction but it's very favored we could draw it like this it's very favored in this direction, and the reason is because of the because of the increase in entropy. So by the Gibbs equation, of course, this is one form: delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Um, if we have a positive increase in entropy, we're going to have a, a a Gibbs free energy that is negative, and so that signifies a spontaneous reaction. Now this reaction is reversible, but it lies fairly far in the direction of this, and I'm about to draw what it forms. And it's going to form something called phosphoenyl pyruvate. And actually, let me back up. Let's screw that. It's going to form something called phosphoenyl pyruvate. Let me just finish drawing. And 
I will mention right now, phosphoenyl pyruvate is, if you take biochem 2, um, you, well, through biochem 1 and 2, phosphoenyl pyruvate is the most unstable high energy molecule you have. It is very unstable. And to understand exactly why it's unstable, we have to look at exactly what it is. It's, it's a phosphoenol. So if I come over here, let me come over here, and this is not the same molecule, obviously, but if I have, here's an enol. The ene is from the alkene. The ol is from the alcohol. And I have its ketone form. The equilibrium is going to lie far in the direction of the ketone, and that's because the ketone is significantly more stable. And so only a very, very, very small fraction of this molecule is going to exist as the enol. In fact, it will uh, almost exclusively exist as the ketone. So you can imagine with phosphoenol pyruvate, normally a molecule like this would want to tautomerize, and that's the term we use, it will tautomerize to form the ketone. But as you can see, it's got a phosphate on it, right? And that phosphate, there's no proton to deprotonate. In fact, if we were to, um, if we were to, oops, still getting used to this. Like I said, if we were to draw the mechanism, it would look something like this. It'd be an electron here, it would kick down, and then this would come out and abstract a proton. The problem is, is right here, there's a proton there, but instead there's a phosphate on phosphoenol pyruvate. So there's a prevention of tautomerization. So this molecule is extremely unstable. In fact, um, this molecule is actually used in the synthesis of a lot of uh, molecules. It's used in the synthesis of all the aromatic amino acids except for histidine. Um, and also it's used in some methanogen. Um, it's worth noting it's used in some methanogen synthesis of methane um, through a phosphonate catabolism. Um, but ultimately, this is very. The point is, this is very unstable, very high energy, and so it's going to be. So if you imagine uh, the enzyme, and I'll go ahead and write it. This is the enzyme that consumes it, pyruvate kinase. And actually, if we were to um, draw the um, mechanism of pyruvate kinase. It's very similar to what we've seen before. This oxygen has a lone pair. It's going to kick up onto, hit the phosphorus. Pi bond kicks up, kicks back down. But instead of normally what happens, it's now going to tautomerize. This electron pair kicks in to reform the ketone, and this electron pair comes in and extracts a proton. And what we end up generating is, of course, pyruvate. Pyruvate. And pyruvate is an alpha keto acid. And it's one of the first alpha keto acids you'll probably see. There's some other ones like um, oxaloacetate is one, um, alpha ketoglutarate, um, alpha ketoadipate is another one. That's a common one. But ultimately, notice I drew this reaction with one, a one-way arrow. And to understand this, we really need to look at a free energy diagram. And I'll come over here and draw that. So we need to look at, oops. Like I said, I'm still getting used to this. We need to look at a free energy diagram, right? So if I have if I have um, if I have phosphoenol pyruvate right here, right, it's going to be the high energy one, right? And of course, this we have to label our axes. This is delta G, and this is just like a, a reaction coordinate or whatever. Not not necessarily delta T. That's incorrect, but suffice it to say, it'll work for now. And then pyr and then. Um, and then pyruvate is going to, I'm losing control of my computer. And then, yes, I'm losing control. Pyruvate's going to be way down there, right? So right here, I don't know what that is. This is PEP up here. This is pyruvate down there. So you notice that PEP is much higher in free energy than pyruvate. And so if we were to work this out, and I mean, this is just abstract numbers, the free energy or delta G is going to be the free, en free energy of formation of the product pyruvate minus the free energy of formation of PEP. And what you would find is that whatever it is, is going to be a very negative delta G. And it's so negative, so negative, that 
this reaction is irreversible under normal conditions. In fact, this enzyme will never reverse itself. And so when you do gluconeogenesis, reverse the reaction, you can't just reverse this enzyme. You're going to have to use a, a, a complete new set of enzymes. In fact, you're going to have to use um, pyruvate carboxylase and then phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase. Um, th this, this particular enzyme does not reverse itself. That's why I drew it in one arrow. And actually, let me also do this because I forgot this, and this is a really important point. This is going to be a generation of ATP. So remember, there were two three phospho or excuse me, two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. So there's two ATP here. So there was two ATP here, and there was two at phosphoglycerate kinase. So in total, we've generated four. Of course, we had to burn two. So we have a two net. ATP and then and then um, three er, glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase form two NADH, which of course go to the electron transport chain. So this right here is our net production for glycolysis: two net ATP and two NADH. So the two that we burned were on hexokinase and phosphofructokinase. The four that we generated, there was two from phosphoglycerate kinase and then two from pyruvate kinase, okay? And the two just stems from the fact that there were two glyceraldehyde three phosphates, okay? Now, one other thing that's worth mentioning, and I talked a little bit about things like this in the previous video, is pyruvate kinase is a magnesium-dependent enzyme. And to understand this, well, we, we have an, a, an incoming ADP. So the, the ADP is stabilized by the chelate effect um, of the magnesium in the active site. Also, one thing that's also worth mentioning, this also has a potassium in the active site. Um, that's sort of beside the point, but ultimately, um, pyruvate kinase, very important reaction. Um, also, one thing I'll also mention about pyruvate kinase is it's also, it's also allosteric. It's an allosteric enzyme, and like I said, we'll go into more detail on the allosteric regulation in another video, but it's an allosteric enzyme, and like we also mentioned, with the free energy, it is irreversible. It has a very negative delta G, it's irreversible, so this will never reverse itself. To reverse glycolysis in gluconeogenesis, for this reaction, you have to use a completely different set of enzymes, okay? And remember, now that we're through with glycolysis, at least the pathway, remember, the three irreversible steps, hexokinase, phosphofructokinase one, and pyruvate kinase. These are your three irreversible reactions in glycolysis. And so when you do gluconeogenesis, you're going to have to use a completely different set of enzymes to do it, okay? Um, other than that, that is pretty much all there is to the payoff phase. But just remember, if we regroup, we started with one glucose, we got two glyceraldehyde three phosphates, and we're also ultimately going to get two um, pyruvates out of it. And what's also worth mentioning now, um, and I'll go ahead and write it, the pyruvate that gets formed goes into something called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is ultimately going to form acetyl-CoA. And I think what you'll find is when you look at these alpha keto acid, that's really this is an alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, there are many of them. There's a pyruvate dehydrogenase, there's an alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. There is a, um, a branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex. There's an, an alpha ketoadipate dehydrogenase complex. They all, they bind different substrates, but every one of them has the same organic mechanism. So what you learn when, when we talk about the PDH, what you learn there is directly applicable when, say, we learn the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. So um, widely applicable, but just remember our net for this pathway is 2 net ATP and 2 net NADH. So um, in future videos, we'll look at the allosteric regulation and... Um, We'll also look at feeder pathways for glycolysis. We can also get other molecules into glycolysis, and we'll look at those as well. See you in the next video.